Hello and welcome to a new Italian PNC video. This day we will be watching and reading about the Piri Rice map. This map was made in 1513 and it's one of the biggest mysteries of mapping and cartography to have ever been discovered in the 20th century. Uh, so we'll be delving into this map and explaining what it means and how it changes the knowledges that we thought we had of the world since this uh, times. Indeed, it was made around five centuries ago, so we, we can say it's very old. And even the texture of the map is different from what one what once we had in those days. In fact, it is not made by normal paper, but it is instead made by the skin of a gazelle. So already we can see that there's something going on in the procedure of making it, and it's very interesting how it could be created by the skin of a gazelle if it was made by European powers, which in those times were the ones that did most of the exploring in the world. But this is all things that we're going to be contesting today, and instead we'll be looking at how it actually was made, and who made it, and what it means for basically history and geography itself for this map to exist. First of all, I want to start by saying thank you for the comments and the amount of support I've uh, received in the, in the last three or four videos, especially those on the topics of Beyond the Ice Wall. I really love your support and I've uh, taken your comments to heart, uh, especially the ones that regarded the music background being too uh, noisy, so I have removed the music background so it's easier for you to understand my voice and you can hear what I say and understand it easier. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, my channel is mostly history content, but there could be some video game gameplay sometimes, so if it bothers you, uh, just don't watch those videos. But anyway, let's uh, get to the next part of the video, which is actually the introduction, as one would say. So, first of all, what is this map? What does it depict? What is going on here? So, as you can see, there are some things that are clearer and some things that are not. So, we can see that this is a nautical map, because we have all these things here, from all these uh, things, like the the, um, the meridians and the parallels, I think these are those. Actually, no, they're uh, nautical things that are nautical rays that are used to navigate easier, or at least were used in those times. Those times are, in fact, the 16th century, or the very early 16th century, in this case, 1513. 1513 is the year this map was completed, although we believe it was actually made earlier, around uh, probably 1511 it was started to be made and it, it took a lot of time to be made, of course, in those times uh, everything was very very expensive, so research, and of course actually even the skin of the gazelle it was made on was even uh, expensive, of course. And as you can see, it is very detailed, it has a lot of things going on. You can see all these sparks, or um, I mean these ships, that are going basically everywhere in the map, and you can really see there's something going on here because of all these, you know, borders and stuff. So what is actually going on in this map? Okay, so if you have, uh, if you have some knowledge of geography and how it was depicted on this time, you can see that this part of the map actually revolves around Europe and Africa. So this part here is actually depicting the coasts, or at least almost all of Iberia, which is the peninsula that is home to Spain and Portugal in modern times, and this very very thin part here is actually depicting France. So you can see and in the, in the Bre Breton Peninsula, in this case, in this area right here. So you can really see there is something going on when it comes to what it actually is depicting. You can see this is probably Madrid or Toledo, uh, I think at the time would be Toledo, and some Spanish or Portuguese merchant here. Uh, here instead is Africa. We already have a lot of things going on here. We have some cities, some very, very elevated knowledge of the inner parts of Africa. So we have the rivers, uh, the mountains even, as you can see here, and even some kings and figures, like we have an elephant, uh, an ostrich, uh, I don't really know what this is, but it's probably another animal. And here we have what I think is Mansa Musa, which was the uh, king of the of the great empire of Mali, which was one of the richest empires in history. And of course, Mansa Musa itself was one of the richest men in history, as he held basically domain over the gold of medieval Africa and much of Europe. 
uh, so much so that when he traveled across Europe and the Middle East, he would uh, gift gold to strangers. And when he returned from the areas he wanted to travel in, he noticed that uh, gold was being used like crazy because all the gold he gave away made the entire economy of gold crash. And now there was major inflation, so gold didn't... Uh, basically, the worth of gold was going down very fast, which is an interesting anecdote. But that said, so we can really see what this uh, depicted there. We have clearly the coasts of Morocco, clearly the coast of Mauritania, and uh, I guess this West Sahara, if you considered it. We have the Canarian Islands, or Can Canaries. Um, this is probably Senegal, uh, Guinea, and the different parts of the Guinea. Probably here is Ivory Coast. Uh, maybe here is Liberia, I would argue, probably. So you can really see we have a very developed knowledge of Africa and Europe. But here comes the actual interesting part. You'd expect a map that is so detailed, and of course revolves around more than just Europe, as you can see here, to be made by the explorers of the centuries that were very famous, so the Portuguese, or the Spanish, or maybe these French, if they started, or maybe some accidental Irish explorers, or maybe something else, maybe even the Moroccans themselves, since it's in Arabic, as you can see, of course. But no, it's not in Arabic, it's actually in Turkish, and the map is made from the Ottoman Empire. So, the Ottoman Empire, for those that do not know, was a unit that existed in those times, and it was a country, or an empire, you would argue probably, that was created by the Turkish uh, Ottoman dynasty, uh, Osmanglu, that conquered from this simple area all of this land and this map, and that by 1513 had conquered the entire uh, Byzantine Empire, so in those that no 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 it's the eastern part of the roman empire the one that had remained alive up to 1453 but then constantinople fell to the attacks of the ottomans and then it was conquered and renamed i mean not renamed it was constantinople for a while but in the modern times we call it istanbul and it is the largest city in turkey so you already know so this is turkey for modern sanders this is greece for modern sanders this is bulgaria serbia croatia Romania, this would be parts of Ukraine and Russia, and so on and so forth. So, as you can see, the Ottoman Empire was already a big empire, but an interesting fact about this empire is that it was not a European-centered empire. I mean, you could argue that having Istanbul would be uh, part of this Europeanness of the empire, and they did claim hey, um, a sort of status of heirs to the Eastern Roman Empire in some ways, Kaiser Irum, but in the end of the day, the the Turkish people itself were themselves were Asian in origin and emerged from Tartaria from the Central Asian steppe, as did the, the Mongol people, and the peoples that conquered the Balkan Peninsula were mostly coming from the peninsula of Anatolia, also called Asia Minor, which is indeed in Asia. So there's a big difference between something like Portugal or Spain discovering and making something as big as this map and the Ottoman Empire making something like this. And the most interesting data is the date. Yes, the date, because 1513 is literally only 19, no wait, 21 years later than when Columbus discovered America. Or in modern terms, he discovered America for Europeans to know. Because we can't say discover because it's insensitive to the native populations. And I get that. But still, he kind of discovered America for the European populations. But not only for them. Because it appears that the Turkish populations and Asian populations of the Ottoman Empire somehow knew about the Americas. Because in fact, if you go right, right here, you can see that he has described the coasts of the American continents. Now, who is he? Who made this map? Well, it actually was made by a Turkish admiral called Ahmed Muhyiddin Piri, and he was also called Piri Reis because Reis is a military honorific in Turkish. So already you can see how interesting this gets. It was made by a Turkish admiral. And why was it made for by a Turkish admiral? Well, because the objective of this map was to be shown 
to a very important person. This was Selim II the Magnificent, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire itself. So this was not a map created for private use or for some navigational purposes of some merchants, but instead it was made by an admiral of the Ottoman Empire to be shown to the Ottoman Sultan himself, which in this case was this very famous guy, who conquered much of what we see in this map. So he was very, very important. That said, what is more interesting about this is the fact that, with all of that, with all of this to consider, you would not expect a sultan to actually throw this map away, you know? He would probably cherish it. But the thing is, the sultan was more interested in the parts of Asia and Europe that he was kind of trying to conquer and uh, make it them enter in their empire. So, in the end, this part of the map is only one-third of the entire Piri Rice map, because it appears that the Asian part and the European part, also showing most of Africa, were cut off and gone through time, because apparently they were not of use to the current emperor, or I mean, the current sultan of the Ottoman Empire. So that's why we only have this part, which in this case is in our hands, because it was found in... 1929 by Gustav Adolf Deismann during transformations of the palace of Topkapi into a museum. The palace of Topkapi was a palace in the city of Istanbul, so once again also called Constantinople right here, and he found this man from Germany, went there and was trying to renovate the palace into a museum because of, you know, the big changes that were going on in Turkey at the time, and while he was searching he found this insane map showing the coasts of the Americas and maybe even Antarctica all the way before basically anyone knew about them. And so here comes the actual like problems with this map. So we have explained who made this map, we have explained what is going on in this map, actually we're, we don't, haven't explained all of what is going on in, map, in this map, we'll be explaining that part later. But the thing we have to understand is that for this map to be made at that point in time means that the entire way we see how history and maybe even geography itself was portrayed in those times is basically wrong, or at least confused. So, let's start by the map of the Ottoman Empire. This was the Ottoman Empire in 1513. So you can see it only spans Greece, I mean, let's just say the Balkans, parts of Romania, Subcarpathia, Crimea, this area here of uh, modern-day Ukraine and Russia uh, has some ports here in this area of Crimea and some ports here in this area of uh, the Northern Caucasus and it spans all over Anatolia. But why would the Ottoman Empire need a map of this area? And how would the Ottoman Empire know what this area looked like? And how would Piri Rice, who him himself never actually traveled to America, to the Americas, know all of these things. So, there's multiple theories, of course, we have to consider all the theories in place, so let's start by the first one, the one that is more accepted by the uh, consensus of historians, as one would argue. What they think is that, basically, Piri Rice knew himself through multiple maps of Portuguese and Spanish explorers what kind of the Americas look like, not really knowing exactly what they look like, but he knew some things about them, and he just kind of winged it and tried to make it like they were looking like this, and casually got it right, apparently, and that's, <laughs> and that's basically the explanation of historians, that he wasn't really knowing what he was doing, he was just taking information from the Spanish and Portuguese maps, and there is more to say about this, I will go into bigger detail. So, one thing that is actually written on the map in Arabic itself, in, I mean, sorry, I, I, see, I, kill, I keep saying Arabic, it's just the Arabic script, not the actual Arabic language. But the th one thing that is written very uh, in detail in this map is that the Genoese explorer, Columbus, yes, and this is very interesting, the fact that in this map he is referred to as Genoese, so from the city of Genoa in Italy, is actually very very important and major, because 
in reality, we have we don't have that many sources that prove that uh, Columbus was Gino uh, from Genoa. And a lot of people like to argue that he was maybe Spanish or Portuguese or he was from somewhere else. But the reality is that some of these sources, like the Perry Rice map, were ignored for a lot of time. And they actually have tangible proof or at least tangible realization that in those times people knew that he was Genoese. And that is pretty major for me as an Italian and probably for a lot of historians too. So that's interesting. But the thing is, in this map, he shows what travels Columbus did. But the thing is that we actually lost ourselves the actual maps that Columbus did in his travels. Because indeed, all the travels that Columbus did to reach the Americas were accompanied by map making. Because of course, he was an explorer, he was a navigator, and he wouldn't just lose the opportunity to make a good map of what he was looking at. And he made maps, but they were lost to time. And the ones that we have now are basically think we think that they are basically the remnants of this Piri Rice map. So probably this might be what uh, Columbus made out made Americas the Americas he traveled out to be, which I think is very interesting if you think about it. Now next on the on the subjects of the topics we want to discuss, I think it's important to realize the difference and distance between the actual Ottoman Empire and what was being portrayed on this map. So here we have the Ottoman Empire in 1513, but the Ottoman Empire was going on a spree of conquests in this period of time. In the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire would go from basically this to this. All right. So it was a huge change. They would conquer most of the Bal actually all of the Balkans, apart from Dalmatia and Istria and Slovenia, I would argue. But they conquered all of you, uh, of, of um, basically all of Hungary, all of Romania, all of Crimea, all of this area. They conquered Azerbaijan. They conquered Iraq. They conquered Syria. They conquered Jordan. They conquered Palestine or Israel. Call it what you may. Uh, they conquered most of uh, the coasts of uh, the Arab Peninsula. Which which they wouldn't go into the desert, but they would actually establish clients, uh, tribal states in the intern lands of the Arabian Peninsula. They would conquer the Omanis and would make them a, a vassal. They would conquer the Yemenis. They would conquer most of Egypt, actually all of Egypt, and not all only. Oh, sorry, and not all of Egypt itself only, but also uh, the southern, the, the sun, yeah, the southern parts of uh, Sudan and actually more like the eastern parts of the Sudan and vassalize the rest, making them a vassal of the Ottoman Empire or a tributary. Then they would actually expand into Eritrea, they would conquer that, they would expand into Djibouti and they would even vassalize the kingdom of Asa or the Sultanate of Asa. I don't really remember what it was, but basically one of the realms that exist in this place, this one. And they even conquered big parts of the old Persian Empire and expanded into Persia. They would create the Mushasa, uh, I actually just vassalized the Mushasa uh, state here. They would expand all the way, and this is the most important part. They would expand their Mediterranean trade all the way up to North Africa's limit, basically. They would conquer all of Egypt, conquer all of livable uh, Libya, conquer all of Tunisia, conquer all of Algeria, vassalize some tribes in the Sahara, and then they would stop at Morocco. So, what this means is that even if when the map was made, the Ottoman Empire looked like this, and it couldn't have been like that near this land that they were, you know, showing, there is something to say that the Ottoman Empire was very well informed of how the territories that uh, surrounded it were looking. Because otherwise they would have not been in the position to conquer all this land and keep it without some stable maps to go along with it. So I think this is very major in this account. What else? What else to say? We have the issue of the Piri map's uh, identity when it comes to what it actually is portraying. So this is the original copy, of course, but we have a fellow um, person that is interested that made an English version of the map, which actually translates, or at least tries to translate, what is actually going on in the American part of the map, which might be the most interesting for you folks. So we can see that we have the basic perfect coast 
of South America, which is probably the most interesting part. The fact that the Ottoman Empire in 1513, thanks to the Admiral Pili Reis, would be able to reflect on a map the voyages of explorers like Pedro Alvarez Cabral, Amerigo Vespucci, Christopher Columbus, all these people, they would be, I would be able to put them on a map. All these explorations. And as you can see, they basically trace this part and put it on here. And it actually looks like the continent itself. So this shaded uh, gray part is actually what the continent looks like in real life. And you can see that it really looks the same. It almost looks like perfect. And how would they have all these informations? How would the Ottoman Empire manage to get all these nautical informations? So for when it comes to the actual uh, voyage of Columbus himself, we have a funny or maybe not that funny, but it's an interesting anecdote that the coastlines and the size of the continents uh, were taken from Columbus's map with Columbus being defined as an infidel from Genoa, as I said, and they were taken in the physical form, these maps, from a seven Spanish ships that were raided by the Ottoman Empire's uh, navy during the uh, 16th century. So basically they robbed the, the, the maps, or at least copies of Columbus's maps, so we know that he they had access to a lot of this. But Columbus did never reach all of South America, we all know that he never reached all this land. He reached only parts of the Caribbean and not even that much of North America, honestly. So how the hell would the Ottoman Empire know what this part looked like. And if you're saying, well, it doesn't really look like that in reality, it just looks kind of like that, well, there is something to say about that too. As you can see, this fellow basically translated the names of the, the islands from the Arabic script to English, and you can see stuff like Antilia. So this island here is Antilia. While Antilia does not, or at least is not thought to be an, a real island, you could argue that my, this could have just been some island of the Caribbean that they didn't really properly know how to map or call at the time. We have the Isle de Vaca, uh, which was, uh, and this caravel having a current uh, the storm was driven upon this island. The commander of the caravel was called Nicolas Juan, and on this island there were many oxen with one horn. For this reason, the island is called Isle de Vaca, which means cow island in Spanish. So, another anecdote, there are islands not this big, but there are islands off the coast of Brazil, so it's not impossible to believe that these might be actual real islands. We have the Fernando de Noronha Island, which is a real island, and all these names that are reported here, you see here, all these names, they actually were existing places that the Portuguese were calling, but it was so early for them to know this, almost too early. And of course, the islands that were to be the actual, you know, um, Caribbean, the main Caribbean, the Antilles. I find it very interesting because they did not know the sizes that well, as you can clearly see by the fact that they made all these islands be gigantic, but they did understand the positions of the islands themselves, like the fact that all these islands were put in the right order, as they are IRL, the map the real map here, the gray one, uh, doesn't really show them, but they are looking like that in IRL too, so it's very interesting to me to see. Even the Virgin Islands, they managed to see that it was uh, an archipelago of islands. And what is... That? okay, this is weird, but uh, anyways, you can see other territories here, like uh, the, the ones in... like clearly this was Cuba. You can really understand by the size of it that this was Cuba. And Puerto Rico probably was this thing, and probably some parts here were still to be discovered as um, uh, the Espanol island itself, but probably some of this were not known yet to the Ottoman Empire. So all of this comes together to actually explain how the Ottomans knew about these lands. And now let's come to something very interesting. What is actually depicted on the map? Because you can see the landmass, but there's things like birds, species of birds, that how would, how would the Ottoman Empire in 1513 know what kind of birds inhabited the American continents? Like, seriously, what kind of intel operation and 
basically psy, uh, spying and taking maps and taking information from the Christian Iberians would have to do to actually reach the amount of knowledge to know about what actually inhabited these lands. And of course, not all of it is uh, realistic. We have some weird things like Dogman and I think those are supposed to be some kind of chimp or some monkey, which is correct because they had monkeys in South America, of course. Mm, probably not the dog people, though. I'm not gonna argue in favor of the dog people. And we have a very interesting thing I featured on the Beyond the Ice Wall video, which is the Bohemian. For some weird reason, the Ottoman Empire showed in this map the Bohemian being put in South America when we actually have Roman accounts of the Bohemian being in like this part of Egypt and Sudan, so it's kind of weird that they put them there, but I guess everybody was searching for the Blemia. Then we have some kind of ox. Oh, it's the ox of the of the island here. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, then some kind of other wild animal. So we they kind of knew what was going on here. I don't really know what this one is, and it's not really set. Unfortunately, I think it might be some kind of dog. Might probably import from the Europeans. I'm not sure. But even then, you can see that they actually have like the correct rivers. And I mean, even the, the, the Rio de Brazil, we have the city of Rio de Brazil, we have the, the you can clearly see Uruguay, then Santa Catarina, some places like that in Brazil. There is also the argument that although the coasts were well detailed, there are some parts that are confusing at, at, to say the least. So the first part that I would say is a bit confused in its objective is Northern America. So North America in this map is not really that like accurate to what it actually looks like. You could argue that stuff like this could be Florida, probably stuff like this, since all of these uh, things here could be a representation uh, more of a, um, a kind of metaphorical representation of New Orleans, the New Orleans Louisiana Delta, Louisiana, and then here is argued that's Panama. I'm not really sure. I guess you could argue that it's Panama because it does close the the North America and South America together. So you could argue that it's Panama pretty well. I, I would, yeah, I would probably put Panama here instead of there, but it's not my my thing to choose. And generally, I find it very interesting. Also, this is something I didn't even mention before, but apparently here is the Silly Islands. Wait, they probably aren't pronounced like this. Shilly? Um, probably Shilly Islands, um, which are the islands just off the coast of uh, England. So it's interesting that they are represented on the map. Or that could be um, Brazil, which was another uh, explored territory that they never could actually map correctly. But I'm not really sure, and there is no words that are on this area, so I'm not really sure. That said, let's come to one of the most interesting parts of this map. Antarctica. So, this could be Antarctica, honestly. Because if we consider this as North America, if we consider this as Brazil, this as Uruguay, this as Argentina, then this, by simple stretch of land, would be Antarctica. And while it is not really possible to be certain that it's Antarctica, because there is no written part that actually says, oh yeah, this is Antarctica, you could probably argue that it could be Antarctica. Because simply the, the how it looks, I really think this part right here, this thing, is the Tierra del Fuego Peninsula. It really looks like it. As you probably can notice, it has the same kind of um, blocks here, same, same kind of uh, a coastline, and it all does the little Tierra del Fuego Peninsula thing here. Not really sure how the peninsula is called, but the island is that, and then there's a little peninsula that comes out, and it literally looks like this. So, my theory, or at least not my theory, but a possible theory, could be that the person that actually traveled all the way here might have been something that was really told by the Ottoman Empire to actually explore these lands and he might have actually made contact with Antarctica but he might not have made a contact with the Magellan Strait so this area right here in the real world and in this map it would have been this area here because apparently he just didn't get there he probably just followed uh, the Tierra del Fuego and since we know that um, the 
really um, a peninsula, really uh, kind of a tail, I would say, of Antarctica. Kind of is really, really close to the Tierra del Fuego. One could argue that he was just went all the way here, and these are probably the Falkland Islands, I would argue, probably, or this one here, then South George Island, maybe, and this could be Antarctica. This could be tail of that one peninsula of Antarctica, and this could be the rest of Antarctica, and maybe these are glaciers and stuff like this. But there is something that kind of ruins this theory, and it is the existence of animals in Antarctica, or at least the depiction of animals, because although not all these depictions of living beings are accurate, there is some, some truth to it, like the species of parrots here, or birds, the fact they have monkeys in South America, the fact that they have uh, elephants and ostriches in Africa, so these things are not made up. Those were actually the animals that exist in those areas. So it is not completely impossible for them to actually, for the Perry Rice map, to actually depict some kind of uh, truth when it comes to the animals. And to depict animals in Antarctica is a bit impossible, since we do know that about 350,000 years ago, Antarctica was livable, I think, it was, that's the time frame, but after that, it, it was not livable anymore for at least not species like they are depicted here, so no kind of multi-horned, bulls and uh, whatever this is supposed to mean i don't really figure out what this is looks like kind of a, like a unicorn mixed with that some kind of dog i don't know i'm not sure and also this thing so it looks like a serpent but you can see that there isn't really something fixed with what it is so the other theory is that this is just a continuation of south america and that they never explored anything after probably uh, Buenos Aires, uh, the Buenos Aires area here, and therefore they just kind of imagined the rest as this huge landmass that continues after Patagonia, with Tierra del Fuego being this thing here, or I don't even know what Tierra del Fuego would be if they even ever got to it. So this would all be Patagonia, this would all be part of South America, and this would all be kind of this land that can't really be proven as something that exists, but it's just like a concept, more likely. And of course, this could be the Andes, which would not really make sense geographically, but it would make sense about the rivers. So it, it, it kind you can kind of see what they were going with when they made this map, when Piri Rice and his workmates and whatever other help he had made this map. Of course, all the sources from the different time frames and from the different authors that came before him helped make up the map. But you can't see this in any other map of the time. Especially not the connection between uh, Brazil, kind of, uh, Argentina, and what else this is. So it's very confusing. Also, there's something else. Some people think that this is not really a depiction of, South, uh, of North America, but they think that this is a depiction of um, literally just Asia. So, you know how when Columbus actually uh, traveled to the Americas, he was actually searching for Asia and was trying to get to the um, islands of the Spice, the, kind of the Spice Islands. Well, he did get to, uh, you know, the Antilles, so the Caribbean, but for a long time he believed he had landed in somewhat the archipelago that surrounded Chipango. So some think that this might not be the depiction of Cuba, or it could be Cuba, but it could also be Cuba mixed with Chipango, which was this kind of imaginary existence. There is no Chipango depicted here, but um, if you look at any old map that was pre-colonial in its themes, you can see the existence of Chipango, which is Japan, by the way, in modern in modern terms. But it is kind of the thing they thought uh, uh, like Eastern Asia looked like. They thought like Korea was some kind of island. They thought that Chipango, so Japan was a uh, archipelago in the kind of traditional sense where there are a lot of tiny islands and some big islands instead of what Japan actually looks like. So this might be just like half of a real map, this part being the truth one and this part being like an approximation of what maybe Asia would have looked like. But then again, how would the uh, Ottoman Empire that was literally half Asian in its territory and its peoples not know 
where like East Asia ended. That's what I'm thinking about. If they have all this knowledge and we know there are two more parts of the Piru Rice map that were lost to time, then how the hell is this what they think that East Asia looks like instead of something more accurate to the maps of, you know, the Chinese, the Koreans, they had maps. They probably could have explained the Ottomans better. The Ottomans did have trades and routes that went all the way into East Asia. Especially in the Far East, I mean, especially in the Middle East, they encountered these merchants. So I don't think this theory is possible, and I don't think this is Asia. I do think this is North America. Maybe not perfect, but I think that, honestly, the Ottomans could have gotten a hold of North America in those times. Not by, tr not by tr the traditional means of simply exploring and putting information on maps, but with a mix of exploration, stealing maps from the European powers, and of course just taking information that they acquired through the merchants that traversed the lands and the lands uh, in the Mediterranean, and the seas, of course, of the Mediterranean. As you can see in the map that shows the Ottoman Empire in its height, of territorial height, you can really see that at some point the Ottoman Empire did go very, very near to what this map actually is. Like, almost, it almost looks like a coincidence that this is the border of the Ottoman Empire, and that's basically where the map starts. So, in, I don't think it's really impossible. Even if it, it's a different time frame, we all know that the um, sultans and the kind of army of the Ottoman Empire wanted to expand all the way, at least all the way into Egypt and this our area of North Africa, even when it just conquered Constantinople. They had big plans, they wanted to conquer Italy, they wanted to conquer most of Europe, they had big plans of expansion. So it's not impossible that this map was made to even consider a possible colonization of the New World, even. Or at least some kind of in interaction with their, um, with their products, with their peoples. And that's why even, they even like figured all these kind of creatures and the Blemia and all this stuff. So it's, it's very interesting, I find it very interesting. Now let's come to the last theory of the explanation of this landmass in the south. So if you don't believe this is Antarctica and you don't believe this is Patagonia, so it's uh, South America, there is one more explanation, some could argue, and that is Terra Australis. So Terra Australis is what the ancients used to call the land beneath the like the southern pole. I mean not beneath on the on the on the, the land but on the southern pole. And that is because in the ancient times, so in the times of the Romans and the Greeks, there was a belief that the like the surface of Earth could not contain a different amount of mass in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. So they just and since they knew that in the northern hemisphere, I mean in the northern part of the world, there were all these kind of um, uh, land masses like Europe, uh, parts of North Africa, far uh, most of Asia. Then the rational explanation for them was that there was a southern landmass that encompassed much of the world in those times. And that was explained through Terra Australis. As you can see, this is the map of uh, another creator, another map maker. This is, of course, way later than the Piri Rice map, since we do have the Americas not perfectly, but mostly rightly mapped, not perfect in size, but still. The general gist of it, we have via California here, we have California itself, we even have all the Andes, the Strait of Magellan, so they did know what this was uh, up. And they did explore some parts here of uh, New Holland, which is Australia, but since they did not know what was going on here, then they depicted what the ancients depicted, so Terra Australis. And the funny thing is, they were right. I mean, it's not correct that the, the southern part of the world has the same mass in the north, but they were right in considering that the southern part of the world had way more land masses than they originally believed. So they discovered all of Australia, they discovered all of New Zealand, and of course, way later, or at least that's what most people say, they discovered Antarctica. And beforehand, people would just re just put Terra Australis there. So one theory could be that the creator of this map maybe did not know where Terra Australis started and where it ended. 
So they just put some kind of connection between South America and Terra Australis, which, funnily enough, since they did not put any real divider, any real land divider, they would almost make so uh, Terra Australis the same continent as South America and North America, which would mean there would be some kind of huge mega continent that spanned from Canada all the way up to the, like, the entirety of the southern globe. Or, I mean, or not globe, call it whatever, the entirety of the southern part of the world. Which is completely bonkers, honestly. But it's pretty interesting to theorize about. But, well, that is kind of it, honestly. There is not much more to say, there is much more to analyze if, you, if someone would want to see all the single thing written on this map. Of course, there were a lot of different um, elements of maps, like the maps of Pedro Alvarez Cabral, again, Amerigo Vespucci, things like this, but they were all like con in the same period that this map was being made. So how the hell did they get all this info in such a short amount of time from the explorations of the Europeans? Of course, these things were longer, it took longer for the information to be spread in those days. So there's a lot of mysteries. And even without the mystery part, the entire point that the Ottoman Empire, some a power that we don't consider usually completely European, had this type of information already proves that the Asian part of the world already knew that there was a lot going on in the New World. Or at least they just discovered it as the Europeans and were not like just somehow backwards in their knowledge of geography. We were, all, we were almost at the same pace at this point in time, the 16th, early 16th century. What? I think I'm gonna be closing the video now. It's been a long video. I hope you enjoyed the content. I hope you understood what I'm talking about. And I hope you theorize in the comments about what this map actually portrays, what it actually means. What if the parts that were portrayed about the natural aspects, maybe the creatures were true. Maybe what if, what if even the, the entire concept of Antarctica being united with South America could have been true at some point of time. I mean, we know that the Beringia Strait was once uh, united, so that Alaska and uh, like Kamchatka and like uh, Chukotia in Russia were united and people passed. So is it really that difficult to believe that at some point South America and Antarctica were united by some landmass? Well, although we don't have any proof, it is interesting to theorize and I don't think the people that made this map just half-assed half -assed it. I do think they put a lot of effort in it, especially the Peer Rice uh, Admiral himself. So it's very interesting to see how it came out. That said, I think I'm going to close the video and see you next time.